The potato is feeding the workers in the Irish agricultural economy, the workers who are producing more valuable crops for sale, for export. Grain, wheat, oats in particular. In the year 1845, the simple balance of Irish life was destroyed. Potato blight arrived from South America in the holes of cargo ships and found in Ireland the ideal conditions to thrive. With only one variety of potato in use at the time, the fungus spread like wildfire, turning the crop to mush. Three to four million people are faced with absolute starvation. As the winter of 1846 wore on, people found that there was nothing left to eat. Countless families were evicted for not paying rent. Starvation brought sickness. Death stalked every village. We start to see people engaging in crisis behavior eating taboo foods. You eat whatever you can find, and it's often things which are just inedible, things like grass. Imagine leaving your house, your home. Just a good house to us place you have grown up in, that you have, your family has lived for generations. Knowing that you will never come back. Even those of you who are lucky enough to survive. That it's over. It's finished. Your life is over. Father, command these souls to life everlasting, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Irish were desperate to leave. While many went to England, the preferred option was North America. But as the costs of entering the United States escalated, in 1847, over 100,000 people chose to head for Canada. <laughs> Many of the refugees are carrying typhus. The doctors look for a black marked tongue and a pale and lethargic countenance. You can go. Are you all staying? These people take care of you, son. Oh, no. Okay? No. We'll come back for you. All right? Daddy! Limerick, Ireland, March 1847. 
Having sold all their earthly possessions and leaving their youngest son sick behind them, the Willis family board the Jesse, a cargo ship bound for Canada. The journey would often take two months against the harsh Atlantic weather. Passengers were locked below decks, where they were less trouble to the captain and crew. On the Jesse, the Willises would have been crammed below decks with several hundred other passengers. All would have had to provide their own food, and there was no sanitation to speak of. Emigration in 1847 is a gamble. There are tremendous risks involved, and sometimes the people taking those risks don't actually know how long the voyage is going to be, how much food they need to bring with them, what the danger of disease is on board. They know that it's risky, but at least getting on the boat offers hope. <laughs> Coffin ships are a perfect environment for lice to multiply and to spread. When somebody comes sick with typhus, louse actually leaves the body because it doesn't like high temperatures. And then it goes to the next warm body and sets up home there. Hey, I saw. Drink this. <coughs> Abandoning their youngest son in Limerick should have brought an end to the Willis's troubles. But the grief they must endure on this journey in search of a new life is only just beginning. Ashes to ashes from dust to dust. And you have to go. Their 18-year-old dies of typhus. His body dropped overboard with little ceremony. After two months sailing across the Atlantic, the Jesse is nearing land. The death rate continues to climb. On the 14th of June, nine weeks after leaving Ireland, the Jesse finally arrives on the Canadian coast. 800 kilometers downriver from Toronto, the quarantine center on the island of Gros Isle was built to deal with the cholera outbreak of the 1830s. In 1847, it was called back into action to deal with the Irish. All passengers were quarantined on their ships. Only the very sickest were sent to the fever hospital on the island. By the time the Willises arrived, there were 36 ships at anchor with over 13,000 people waiting for permission to continue upriver. As the holes of some of the ships were opened, people were found to be up to their knees in filth and excrement. Good afternoon, Captain. Welcome aboard, Doctor. On Grosil, the limited medical facility that they had did the best they possibly could, but they were overwhelmed. Dr. Douglas, who's the medical superintendent of Grosil, emerges as one of the unsung heroes of the Great Famine. Oh, please. Manager sort of completely commits himself to working as hard as he can amongst the poor, you know, great personal risk to himself. I'm sorry, you have to go with the nurse. Many of his, his assistants and many of the priests and ministers who visit the island die from fever contracted from the immigrants. Uh, I'm afraid you'll have to go with the nurse. The article that was found in the Toronto Globe states that at Gros Eel, 16 year old Mary Ann Willis is taken from the ship for treatment at the hospital. 
And there would be good chances that when you were taken off ship in the St. Lawrence River, that you wouldn't return. But that would be your grave.
It's an extraordinary place. The ever presence of death and complete lack of hope seems to pervade it all. One imagines 65 people in each of these spaces, in cots, August, hot. The smells and sounds must have been pretty ghastly. And form that realization at some point in time that you're not going to recover from the illness. Or if you have recovered, your wife or your husband or one or more of your children is, are not going to recover. And what that must have been like. I find that very difficult to deal with. It must have been very difficult. That year? Vous pouvez voir mon chambre personnelle? Juste là. Là. Mais ce que je voulais vous dire, c'est que je trouve ces sept jours de quarantaine interminable. Avec ces examens médicaux où on nous observe et on nous inspecte. Et ne me faites pas parler de la douche désinfectante. Avez-vous pris votre douche? Oui. Comment vous avez trouvé la douche? Unbeknownst to her family, a week after being taken off the Jesse, young Mary Ann Willis died alone at the quarantine hospital. Buried in a shallow grave, she is just one of the 5,424 Irish famine refugees who died at Gros Eel, which has since become a protected historic site. So these are names that really make up the commonality of what we know in Canada. Certainly they're very familiar names. But it's so many people. So we've Whitakers, Williams, and there she is, Mary Ann Willis. The only one of the family to die here in Gros Hill. and. Strangely enough, she's the only Willis on the wall as well. Everything about her life seems to have been very lonely, and singular certainly in death. Even though she came from a family of seven, it must have been terrible to have lost her brother on the dock in Limerick. And then two siblings on the voyage across the Atlantic. And then had to say goodbye to her parents here in Gros Hill. Then to die here on her own. People have a strong survival instinct. They need to suppress what they have witnessed and seen to get through to make new lives for themselves. But, you know, there's a cost involved there, inevitably. For the Willises, the cost is unimaginable. In just two months, they have lost four children and travel now ravaged by grief in a foreign land. But the cost to Toronto would be even greater. The Irish refugees traveling upriver carry one of the deadliest diseases known to man. The fever sheds the archeologists are looking for those same fever sheds that Bishop Michael Power would eventually persuade the council to build. Now overflow with the sick and destitute. And the young frontier city of Toronto is in danger of being completely overwhelmed. <laughs> 